Good morning. As Sam said, my name is Jeremy. And it's a privilege just to be here this morning to be able to preach. Um, and I know I was just reflecting this morning as I got up, as I know Sean often will say, like, yeah, I got up at 4.30 in the morning because I was already thinking about the sermon and all those things. So sure enough, I was up at 4.45 this morning and, and just reflecting on, um, you know, just the joy that it would be to, you know, Doug, who mentor of mine, seminary professor, grew up at New Life, um, sitting under his preaching to, you know, just to, I hope a joy of his that I'm, I'm able to be up here this morning to, to preach to you all. Um, so I just thought I'd share that reflection this morning in the midst of my, my time praying. Uh, but we're in 1 Samuel um, this morning. So it's the uh, ninth book of the Bible. Um, it's the, the first of the ones and twos. Um, so you have Samuel, Kings, and Chronicles. Uh, so if you have your Bibles, you can open to 1 Samuel 16, um, and we'll be in those first 13 verses. Uh, and the question that I, um, that I hope to answer this morning as we kind of frame the passage uh, is how do you see yourself? How do you see yourself? And, and how do you see others? Because uh, there's a lot of different ways that we can cut up and, and slice a passage and seek to apply it and, um, and walk through it. Uh, but I want, for the sake of this morning, for you to keep, uh, keep that question in your mind. Right? How do you see yourself and others? As we consider that question, we're going to look at uh, the importance of, of real beauty, the source of it, and, and then how is that cultivated in our lives? So let me read our passage for us this morning, uh, starting in 1 Samuel 16, verse 1. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul, since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord and invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for him whom I declare to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, do you come peaceably? And he said, peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourself and come to me, come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, surely this, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadad, Abinadad, and made him pass before Samuel and said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shema pass by and he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. Then Samuel said to Jesse, are all your sons here? And he said, there remains yet the youngest, but behold, he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and get him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, as we come to your word, um, would you remind us afresh that it is your word, your word spoken to us. Um, it is life. It is good. Encourage us, Father. Meet us in the midst of uh, the struggle, the pain, the joy. Father, meet us where we are as you do so well. Father, even better than we're, how we think we know ourselves, would you meet us this morning and we would leave here changed because we have seen you, the risen Savior, Jesus our Lord. Amen. So let's look at the importance of real beauty first. The heart of our passage is down in, in those uh, verses 6 and 7. You have verse 6 that says, When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, 
surely this is the Lord's anointed before him. Which makes complete sense, right? He's tall, he's handsome, he, he has stage presence. The, these are the important qualities, especially in that day when it meant protection and safety. It is believed that uh, William Wallace, right, Braveheart, the Scottish king in the war for Scottish independence was at least 6'5", maybe 7 foot. They don't really know how tall he is. But the reason that they get to that height is because he had a broadsword. And that broadsword was 5 feet 6 inches long. The average height of most men in that day, in Wallace's day, was about 5'5", five, 5'6". Five, five, so you can see really quickly why people start rallying around him when he is a foot taller or more than almost everyone else. His sword was as tall as the common man. And that, at least in part, is, is why Samuel responds the way he does in, in, in verse 6. But then you get to verse 7, and what does the Lord say? Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. So the first lesson for us this morning is God's eyes see truly. God's eyes see truly. They see rightly. And what God's eyes see is eternal. Right? It's real, real beauty. God tells us not to be focused on the external. You have passages like 1 Peter 3, 3-4. Three through 4. Do not let your adorning be external. It's pretty clear. The braiding of hair, the putting on of gold jewelry, or the clothing you wear. But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart, with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. Or Proverbs 31, 30. Charm is deceptive. Beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Right? Externals are temporary. Right? It's always going away. Whereas internal beauty can actually get stronger and stronger and stronger and build over time throughout your life. So external beauty, brain smarts, all those things are, are actually not matters of the heart. What is going to make a kingdom go well is not that that king is a great warrior, although it, it helps, or that he's a brilliant tactician. Again, it'll help. It'll be good. It's the king's heart, according to God, that the king is wise, that he is loving, that he leads well. And what God is saying to Samuel and, and to you and me this morning is don't get distracted. Don't look at and become focused on the wrong thing. Don't be like everyone else in the world, focus on external appearances. What matters is what is in the heart. Right? Out of the outflow of the heart, the mouth speaks and we act. So God is making an overarching statement when he says, the Lord does not look at things the way people look at them. And what that means is that this is an abiding problem for all people throughout all time. This isn't just in David's day, Samuel problem. Right? To be preoccupied, to be distracted, even consumed by the externals. And I would say for us in our present time, uh, that problem has been intensified. And I think there's at least two reasons why there is. You have kind of technology media, and you have a philosophical reason. So first, that technology media reality. Instagram. I think we all kind of know Instagram, or at least heard of it. It, it is a huge and continues to be a prominent piece in the technology sphere. I remember when it first came out. And... Um, Stealing the limelight from Facebook, which was predominantly um, you know, instant word communication across your friend group. Facebook buys it in 2012 for a billion dollars. 
At the time, it was the largest purchase to date. The company had, you want to guess how many employees? 13. Yeah, you, you laugh. That's what people did in 2012 when they bought it and said, they're, they're fools. How, biggest mistake. Facebook understood the power of images. Last year, it was about valued at $47 billion. And the year before that, it was 33. Images are powerful. We get our news from memes. People love little short video clips to tell them everything they need to know about the day, or about yesterday, or last week. We are marketed to and blasted with pictures and content that the all-seeing eye shows us we need to see because of a word we said yesterday. And that's not even including all the other platforms that we engage with that are out there. We are bombarded constantly. So that's how tech has intensified this reality. Philosophical, a philosophical reason. We are at a time in our culture when what is right and wrong and what truth is, is up for debate, right? What time in our culture, we are at a time in our culture when moral absolutes are up for debate. Almost every culture in the past has had some sort of understanding of those moral absolutes. Right, an understanding of what is right and what is wrong and what truth is. But we are at a time now where our culture says, you can decide what's right and wrong, and that's fine as long as it doesn't hurt someone else. But they don't define what harm or hurt is. And you have several philosophers have, have put forward that we don't know how to define evil, which therefore then means we don't know how to define what moral goodness is either. We can't. And since we can't do that as a society at, at all, society at large is left with uh, subjective reality and the external. Right? Money, looks, and the likes, and, and everything else that falls into that category. And so because of these two things, at least, technology and the philosophical reality that we are in, it puts more and more pressure on the externals, on comparisons and the like. And am I giving up to the, uh, am I living up my life to the prevailing thought of the day that the wind has blown in? It's, and it's devastating, it is devastating. We are all blasted with what, it, what we're supposed to look like, right, all the time. It doesn't matter if you're a teenager, if you're in your 30s, you're in your 50s, your 60s, or you're older. Men and women alike. So what do I mean by inner beauty? It's that your life's not going to be basically determined by the externals. Right? In reality, it's going to be defined by the internals. Are, are you less prone to selfishness? Less prone to self-pity? Less prone to envy? Less prone to vanity? Are you less sensitive to criticism? Are, are you wiser? Are you more joyful? Are you more grateful? Are you less anxious? Those are the things that are going to set you apart from others. That is the stuff that will set the course for your life and leave a lasting legacy when you are long gone. So that's the importance of it. So what's the source of true beauty, of real beauty? This comes from the last passage of our, our text this morning. In verse 13, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. Please don't think that what God means in verse 7 when he looks at Eliab and he talks to Samuel, is that he looked at all these sons of Jesse and, and they all had these bad hearts, except one, David. And therefore he's choosing that one because he has a good heart. I've heard that sermon before. You have probably heard that sermon before. 
If that's what you think, you're going to have a, you're going to be very surprised when you read the rest of David's life. And he starts making some really poor choices and some really, does some really terrible things. The point is, if David is going to be a true king, then it will have to be a gift of the Holy Spirit. Have to be a gift of the Holy Spirit. Right, a humble reliance on the Holy Spirit and his work in David's life. And that's what you see in David's life. It's, it's a life marked by repentance. Yes, great sin, poor choices along the way, but he is continually coming back to Christ. He is continually looking to God and the, the, the promise that is to come. He has a humble reliance on the Holy Spirit. Let me say this another way. There are people you know that are just cruel people. You could probably say that and names come to your mind. And then there's people that are just genuinely kind. All those people that you would put in the category of, of being genuinely kind, not cruel, have the seeds of cruelty in their hearts. The same with liars. Every person has the seed of being a, a complete liar and deceiver in their hearts. Right? In our natural state, the only thing keeping us from being total deceivers and outright cruel and fill in the blank, that list could go on, is the common grace of God in our lives. If you know Christ, it's the work of the Holy Spirit in it. And to some part, it's the ways in which our hearts were cultivated by other people. For David to be a true king, he must have the Holy Spirit in him. Right? True kingliness is the true beauty that I've been talking about so far this morning. Ordinary human nature says this. It says, your life for mine. Your life for mine. I'll get into a relationship only if it's going to pay off for me. Right? I'll do fill in the blank as long as it's serving my interests. I'll help this person out this weekend. I'll go to this event because it's going to give me fill in the blank. That's ordinary human nature. True kingliness, real beauty says, my life for yours. I'm only happy when I see you thriving. Even if it means that I'm sacrificing. That's beauty. The reason the Holy Spirit has to come into your life is because you and I are not capable of that on our own. Romans 3, 10, 10, verses 10 through 11, is absolutely 100% true. And it says, none are righteous, no, not one. Right? No one understands, no one seeks for God. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is upon their lips. Jacob Needleman is a, he was a secular philosopher at a university published a book years ago titled, Why Can't We Be Good? Mind you, secular philosopher. He says this, social theorists say, here's how you ought to live. Therapists say, this is how you ought to live. Politicians say, this is how you ought to live. He says, the basic problem or issue is that we all pretty much know how we ought to live. We just can't do it. <laughs> Oh, profound from a secular philo philosopher. And that's the problem of the human race. As I've been going through all these several characteristics this morning of a true king and what true inner beauty is, sacrifice, lifting up others, thinking and caring of other people, you're probably saying like, oh, of course, that's how I should, that's how I want to live. That's how we should be living. That is good. I'm going to nod my head at that. But the problem is, we're often not doing that. And it often seems like we can't, right? We, we can sit here on a Sunday morning and go, yeah, man, I need, to be, I need to be a better husband. I need to be a better spouse. I need to be a better parent. I need to change these things. I need to do those things, right? We, we go through those lists of things. And then we leave and we go, shoot. I'm right, I'm right back to where I was before. But it often seems like we can't. 
So where does that leave us? It leads us to our third point. How we cultivate it in our lives. So look at verse 10 of 1 Samuel 16. 10 through 12. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. And then Samuel said to Jesse, are all your sons here? And he said, there remains yet the youngest. But behold, he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and get him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. Right, just an aside, notice that David is not unattractive. I mean, it's a, just a fascinating verse that's added in the midst of our, our passage tonight. Notice the Bible doesn't say, don't focus on eternal, externals. So we're only going to choose unattractive people. It doesn't say that. That's kind of how we would respond. Like, we hear, don't focus on externals. Like, okay, that's how we're going to... And God's world is different. Right? What he's saying, the Bible says, what he is saying, it's not an important thing. So Samuel is going through all of the sons, and God's going, no, 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 no. And you, I mean, you can almost feel and see the, the beads of sweat starting to, to pour down Samuel's face like, I thought I was coming here to anoint someone. Finally, Samuel asks if there's other sons, like the final straw, like maybe there's someone that you haven't brought yet, even though you've lined up all seven kids, is there an eighth? And Jesse says that there's the youngest. And that word, the word has a really negative pejorative to it. Right? It's akin to the smallest or runt, which is why he's not there. Right? If he brings everyone else out, all seven brothers are there. Oh, I forgot to call the eighth. Because it's almost as if he's of less value than all the others. So surely if Samuel's coming to anoint someone, it's going to be one of these seven. So I don't, we don't even need to bother with him. We'll let him just keep tending to the, to the flocks. One commentator on this passage said this, which I, I thought was very helpful. So I'll read it, read it for us. It says, David is kind of a male Cinderella, left to the domestic chores instead of being invited to the party. But the tending of flock into which where his responsibilities will give him exactly what he needs in the Goliath battle and later to lead his people. This David story plays out the reversal of primogeniture, which is basically the right of succession uh, belonging to the firstborn child that dominates Genesis. David is not only not the oldest, but not one of seven sons, the Hebrew number for completeness. David is the eighth child and therefore not even there at all. Here's what he's saying. One of the main things of the Bible is the reversal of the world's values. God's kingdom is not the world's kingdom. It is what I like to call, and I'm sure I just picked this up from someone else, it's the upside-down, inside-out kingdom. It deliberately rejects the world's values. Abel is chosen, not Cain. Isaac is chosen, not Ishmael. Jacob, not Esau. Chooses Moses, not Aaron. God chooses Sarah and not Hagar. God chooses Leah and not Rachel. It is the upside down, inside out kingdom that he is establishing. So how do all these things come together and weave into each other? It's all pointing to the cross. Listen to 1 Corinthians 1, 22 through 25. It tells us, for the Jews demand signs, right? That's power. Jews demand signs. And Greeks seek wisdom, intellect. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men. 
and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Right? David is pointing us to another child of Bethlehem. He is pointing us to the one who on the cross wasn't merely forgotten by his father. He wasn't ignored by his father like David was. He was forsaken by his father. Here in Christ, you have true beauty, real beauty on display. And Isaiah 53, or 52 says that um, he had no beauty at all. No beauty that we could count. That we should desire him. And he was beaten and he was put on the cross. Here is someone who is beautiful beyond bearing, put on the cross, beaten and disfigured, and bore our sins so that if you believe in him, God looks at us and he sees us in him. He sees the payment for our sins completely and utterly satisfied. So when you see him dying on the cross for you, that's, that's true beauty. That's selfless love to the nth degree. And that's the only thing that will change you into someone who is capable of the same thing. That's the, the secret, if you will. Right, only when we see him doing all of that for you and, and, and I, and, and you embrace that, and you know that in Jesus Christ, you are accepted, fully accepted, and loved. Knowing all the things that you have done, all the ways that you have sinned against him, that you are seen as glorious. In fact, that's how God speaks about you, if you are his child. You're royalty. You're set apart. That's 1 Corinthians 2.9, right? You are a chosen race. Chosen not just, well, this is who I'm left with, all right. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of his own possession, for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of, dark, excuse me, out of darkness into his marvelous light. And I love the dovetail of flashlights that, men, you get this morning, my father's. This <laughs> Perfectly, perfect sermon illustration. And I promise you, we didn't even coordinate that. But only that, brothers and sisters, this morning, that only that can destroy or at least begin to destroy your need to appear great and beautiful before others. And it's only that which can help you detect and cultivate that in your life. All right, it's the only thing that moves us from, well, this is just how I am kind of mentality, right? You can change. You know why you can change? Because you have the Holy Spirit in you. Don't settle. If you're not a Christian this morning, come, come to him. Speak to Sam, speak to myself, speak to, speak to the person sitting next to you, and they'll, they'll talk to you. And they'll direct you to someone else. But that offer is before you this morning. If you're tired of trying and trying and trying and realizing it's not working, it's because it never was meant to. C.S. Lewis in The Great Divorce, um, which is a, a fictional book that's a, a parable of sorts um, where he is trying to get across certain ideas. Um, and in The Great Divorce, it all centers around a, a busload that can fly. So, um, if you haven't read it. Uh, and, and there's a, a conversations that go on between uh, pr predominantly one person on the bus. And, and that, that person has a, a guide with them. And there's a dialogue that they have back and forth with each other. Um, so it's a, a book I enjoy. Um, C.S. Lewis, an author who I enjoy a lot. But I thought this was um, very fitting. A little longer, but I think it's worth it. Um, and he says in there, um, and only partly do I remember the unbe unbearable beauty of her face. Is it, is it? I whispered to my guide. Not at all, said he. It's someone you never, you've never heard of. Her name on earth was Sarah Smith, and she lived in Golder Green. 
Golders Green. She seems to be, well, a, a person of particular importance. She is one of the greats. You have heard that fame in this country and fame on earth are two quite different things. And who are all these young men and women on her side? They are her sons and daughters. She must have a very large family, sir. No, she never married. Every young man or boy that met her became her son. Even if it was only the boy that brought her meat on the back door, every girl that she met was her daughter. In her, they became themselves. And now the abundance of life she has in Christ from the Father flows over into them. Yes, he said. It is like when you throw a stone into a pool and the concentric waves spread out farther and farther. Who knows where it will end? Redeemed humanity is still young. It has hardly come to its full strength. But already there is joy enough in the little finger of a great saint such as Sarah Smith to awaken all dead things of the universe into life. It's the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. Would we all be Sarah Smiths as we go through our day, not knowing the people we interact with and the impact that we have in their lives? Would we open ourselves up to that reality and take the focus off of me, what I need in this moment, right? The ordinary you for me, me for you exchange that I talked about before. So in closing, brothers and sisters, look for beauty, true beauty as much as possible. Cultivate it, desire it, fight against the value systems of this world. Don't run from the world. Please don't run from the world. Take Christ with you into it. There's a flashlight to help. Take Christ with you into it. Look at the cross so that you can look beyond the surface for yourself and as you look and as you engage with others. Cling to Christ who is not just the author of your faith, your faith, but who is also the perfecter of it. And by his grace, who you are next week and next month and next year will be different than who you are today. As we submit our lives and our, our hearts to Christ afresh today, his mercies are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. Amen. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Father, for giving us just the vision of what really matters. Father, guard our hearts, guard our hearts against ourselves, guard our hearts against the world and its value systems and, and the enticing appeal. Father, what true beauty is and, and what will really last. Forgive our superficiality. But Father, I, I ask that you would teach us to become a people of character, not just through resolutions um, and trying, but through seeing your son losing all beauty, that we could have true beauty forever in him. And Father, only when we see that and we see him high and lifted up can we be changed. Father, help us to continue to uh, press in to your reality, how you see this world. And Father, that's only done as we look to your son, Jesus Christ. We pray this in his name, in his name alone. Amen.